I'm happy to introduce now our first speaker, Dr. Ross Hagen. Um, Dr. Ross Hagen received his MM and his PhD in musicology from the University of Colorado at Boulder. He currently teaches several music classes at UVU and is a performer and, comp and composer specializing in black metal and other extreme and marginal music styles. The title of his presentation is Resistance is Futile, The Limits of Transgression in Popular Music. Dr. Hagen. Cool, thank you. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this. It's, this is actually uh, stuff I get to research a lot, but I actually don't often get to um, really dig into it in uh, my classrooms as much. Um, so yeah, this is um, a talk dealing um, well, sort of with the, the, the overall, I mean, as you can see in the, in the program, kind of the overall um, thrust is dealing with um, sort of how musical styles that are initially considered um, dangerous or countercultural um, sort of inevitably become safe. Um, and that can actually happen pretty quickly. Um, but, uh, and there are a lot of kind of uh, ins and outs to it, but in particular I'm focusing here, um, as we'll see on, this genre of underground heavy metal uh, called black metal that um, sort of coalesced in Norway in the early 1990s. Um, and uh, sort of brings up the question of, you know, if this is something that can become um, institutionally sanctioned, uh, then it would be, you would be, you would be hard pressed to find something else that wouldn't. Um, but so just a little bit of uh, kind of background um, on not just this, but also I think kind of the idea of transgression in just music in general. Um, that uh, music, I think, is a particularly interesting field to look at this, these ideas of transgression because um, music is something that sort of plays on our... Uh, um, emotions and states of mind in very, very interesting ways and very powerful ways. Um, and you can kind of, you know, if you look, take like a big broad view of, of music, um, you know, even going back well into, into antiquity, you have kind of two sides to this. Um, on the one hand, you have the music that is associated with reason and with order of the universe and with authority. Um, and we can kind of see this here. Uh, this is a diagram of what's called the uh, celestial monochord. Um, and with this idea that here the intervals are associated with um, uh, you know, various uh, like signs of, the signs of the zodiac and kind of like the order of the universe. Um, and here being tuned, uh, that's the, the hand of God up there tuning it. Um, and so you have kind of this side um, but then, of course, on the other side, you have the music that is dealing with uh, sort of intense emotional states um, or music that is just expressive of emotion and then is also expressive of uh, things like um, drunkenness, altered states of mind, um, trance states, magic. Um, you know, it's not for nothing that, you know, when we think of words like enchantment or incantation, that at the root of that is the term chant um, for singing. Um, and of course, above all, music that's associated with sex and fertility. Um, and it's sort of like, you know, you could sort of see these, these two things here where, you know, on the one hand, it will be hard to imagine church or a wedding or a funeral without music. On the other hand, it would be hard to imagine seduction and sex without music. Um, and the music that is often associated with um, things like fertility uh, is often music that is more associated with either lower classes or outcast groups. Um, and often also of young people. 
um, all of whom have less investment in the status quo as it is. Um, and oftentimes you'll find that this music is considered almost, you know, it's not just a matter of individual sinfulness, it's, a, it's like an existential threat to the order of society. Um, and you can see this even as far back as Aristotle and Plato. Um, but the power of this music is often also something that then gets uh, kind of folded into um, the structure of state and institutional authorities, uh, just because it has that power. And so a classic example of this in popular music, or sort of the classic example, um, is British punk rock in the 1970s. Um, and this became subject to um, uh, a study by a scholar by the name of Dick Hebdige um, in his book Subculture, The Meaning of Style from 1979. Um, you know, it's as old as I am, but it still has some uh, relevance. And his overall thesis here you know, from sort of seeing what happened with British punk, was that you had this youth subculture that was very oppositional to mainstream society, very critical of it, um, in many ways coming, kind of coming up from the working class. Um, and uh, this was a time period in England when being, uh, if you were a working class young person, your life was not particularly pleasant, potentially. Um, and so this was a, uh, you know, sort of a, a, well, as the British would say, it's not a middle finger, it's this to the authorities. Um, and what Hebdige saw, though, was that, you know, while this sparks kind of a moral panic in which these people become kind of the symbol for everything that is wrong and broken in, in society, um, that what ultimately happens is not necessarily that the authorities have to come in and just like, you know, uh, just like slam it down and grind it underfoot like 1984 style. They don't have to do that. That what he saw happening was that the subculture gets kind of diffused into the rest of society, um, which also defuses it a little bit. Um, so that, you know, you have these punk fashions become a commercial product um, and that ultimately the members get reclaimed by respectable society. Um, and just as a couple of examples of that, so one of the, the group that sparked this um, in no small measure um, was a punk band, a very short-lived punk band called the Sex Pistols, um, which uh, basically sort of proved the, at the um, excuse me, the aphorism that there's no such thing as bad publicity, uh, because that was kind of all they did. Um, and so the Sex Pistols, uh, let's get a little bit of them in your ears here. Uh, this is their song, uh, God Save the Queen. <laughs> And so forth. I mean, words like God Save the Queen, the fascist regime, there's a significant s segment of British society in the 70s that was going to be quite offended with that. Um, and then ultimately, um, the thing that really sort of sparked this off, this is a tabloid um, coming the day after they were on um, a show uh, hosted by Bill Grundy on the BBC, uh, which would be kind of like the British equivalent of something like 60 Minutes or just like a sort of news talk show. Um, and also something that at the time, since there were like maybe three BBC channels, it was something that everybody would have had on. Um, and the Sex Pistols were on kind of at the last minute. Grundy was kind of a jerk to them, so they cussed him out on live TV. Um, and it became this huge scandal. So TV fury over rock cult filth 
I'm going to tell you how awful, awful, awful all this is, but we're going to tell you exactly what they said, too, right? Um, but so this then became this huge scandal. But then within a few years, um, this kind of begins to, you, you start to see things start to kind of um, mellow out a little bit, and punk becomes just kind of part of mainstream society. Um, two examples that I thought of. Um, one here on, over here is the uh, poster for the sort of zombie comedy, or the zombie punk comedy, um, Return of the Living Dead, which you know, features music by lots of, lots of punk bands, um, Back from the Grave and Ready to Party. Um, it's a fun movie if you haven't seen it. Um, and then on the other side here, um, this is one that I have vague memories of the actually seeing, um, was the ABC After School Special, um, The Day My Kid Went Punk, um, which is just, it's so sincere um, that in this case you have a kid who, you know, what do you do when your bright, talented, lovable kid turns into a punker overnight? The Nelsons are about to find out. Um, and, of course, in this, what happens is that, uh, you know, the parents learned that, hey, you know, he's still your bright, talented, lovable kid. He just has red hair now. And he cut the sleeves off of his shirt. Um, and, you know, and, and everybody learns a valuable lesson at the end. Um, and then, you know, even if you fast forward um, more recently, you get things like this. Uh, Green Day's American Idiot musical. So now... Uh, punk rock is a subject of a Tony Award winning musical starring finalists from The X Factor. Um, which I, I can't decide if this is the least punk thing imaginable or the most punk thing imaginable. Um, and so in any case, this is sort of, you know, you can kind of begin to see how this, how this, how this works. And typically, you know, um, actually, if you look at uh, the time period that it takes to get to something like this, um, you know, you can get it within a generation. Um, I'm put in mind of, uh, well, of the uh, Super Bowl halftime featuring Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg, who 30 years ago were an existential threat to the youth of America. And now they're, uh, well, they're still doing great stuff. Anyway. So now to, with punk as our example, um, now we'll get into Norway with some stuff that is a little bit um, sort of less visible. Is there a way to get the projector a little bit brighter? Sorry, some of this is fairly dark. Um, but I suppose that's okay. So uh, this, and again, this is what sort of comes out of my specialties um, in research or things that I managed to get myself really um, deep into um, was in the early 1990s you had a this sort of subculture in Norway um, based around underground heavy metal music um, and here it was trans and it was transgressive actually in oh, okay yeah that helps actually uh, if we can bring bring it down on stage, there we go. Yeah, that's fine. If it's all if it's if it's all if it's all or nothing, all right. Um, I don't know, maybe a little bit of light, just because the. There we go. Oh, can we get that halfway one? Yeah, anyway, all right. Okay, cool. So, one of the things about this is that, um, on the one hand, as you'll as you'll hear compared to the standards of most popular music, um, it is quite transgressive. Um, but it's also kind of transgressive against heavy metal itself, um, just to give a little bit of context with it. Um, and one of the, th the main sort of musical and visual things about it is that it is sort of purposefully simple and kind of unpolished. Um, so. This, and this band in particular that 
um, we're dealing with um, is the band Dark Throne um, with uh, this album, A Blaze in the Northern Sky uh, from 1992, uh, which came out on a UK record label called Peaceville, which at the time, you know, in this sort of underground world was sort of the, like one of the premier labels out there. So it was kind of about as good as you could hope to, hope to get. Um, and initially, let me see, where's my slide? Okay, there we are. Um, Dark Throne's music was kind of, was very much in the sort of uh, fairly well-polished and professional sounding um, underground metal of the time, which heavy metal is, as a musical style, very difficult to record because everything has to sound huge. Everything has to be as loud as possible, which from an engineering standpoint isn't possible, but it has to sound that way. Um, and so at the time, uh, studios that specialized in it had kind of come up with um, ways, ways to do this. They had kind of a formula. Um, and so Dark Throne's first album, um, which is not, th this is their second one. Uh, their first one has that kind of sound to it, which again, in context, this is actually going to sound probably fairly transgressive to all of you just as it is. But in context, this was kind of the norm. So it's a bit difficult to hear over this over this PA system, but the you know everything is you know really really precise, fairly clear um, as far as the um, the musical performance and the overall sort of tones and sounds of it. And so then on this album, though. Um, Dark Throne took a pretty big left turn and decided that, you know, no, that we don't want our music to sound like that. Um, they wanted it, in essentially, essentially they were kind of going for almost kind of a retro thing, where they wanted the music to sound, um, you know, kind of like the demos that they grew up with and that they, and that they knew and loved well, these kind of do-it-yourself sort of recordings. Um, so their next one... <laughs> Uh, a blaze in the northern sky is you know the tones are very you know the, the guitar sounds like it's being you know, played through a cardboard box um, and when they sent this to the record label the record label um, asked them if they had forgotten to mix it. Um, and they said, nope, that's what it sounds like. Um, then uh, the next year, it went even further. with the album Transylvanian Hunger, which again sounds like it was recorded with just a, like a boom box with a microphone in front of it, um, on purpose. That was, that was what they wanted.
very repetitive, very simple um, kinds of stuff, but really, really harsh. And so, you know, what ultimately happens with this is that um, although this at the time was very much sort of a, again, sort of metal against the standard at the time, um, it very quickly then becomes kind of its own sort of standard. Um, and you have uh, bands both in Norway and around the world um, that from this point on are writing and recording music that deliberately sounds like that because that's now the model. That's a new standard. Um, and this was helped. And so this is something that, you know, when you hear this, um, to put it euphemistically, the audience for something like this is pretty limited. Um, and purposefully so, I think. Um, but the thing that sort of brought this out into uh, the uh, wider visibility um, was, again, this sort of shows how this all works, was a crime spree in 1992, um, followed by a, a panic in the tabloids. Um, but then, now, if we look at it, um, we're dealing with something that is a major musical export for Norway and for Scandinavia in general, um, which most people would probably be hard pressed to think of music that they listen to or that they know about that is from Norway. Um, although you might be surprised um, because most successful pop songwriters over the last generation have been from Scandinavia. Anyway, or a lot of them have. Um, but so this crime spree uh, did not directly involve Dark Throne, really. Um, but you had, um, just very briefly, this is one of these things where um, we need to sort of talk a little bit about sort of how this became popularized, if you want to call it that, was that essentially in 1992, you had um, this fellow here, the musician Varg, Varg Vikernes, who was the sole member of a band named Burtsum, um, who, he's one of these people you, can, you cannot believe anything that comes out of this man's mouth. Um, boulders of salt you have to take. Um, but he embarked along with um, Oystein Arseth uh, from Mayhem um, on a, an arson spree um, targeting Norwegian churches. Um, to hear him say it, it was perhaps this idea of like trying to revive ancient heathen ideas, um, but more or less it was publicity stunts, I think. Um, but that, uh, you know, one, and so here we had a sort of cheeky t-shirt that they made, um, the Burzum Tour 92, coming soon to a church near you with a list of ones that had burned. Um, and then the first one, uh, Fantoft, which was a reproduction of a, of a wooden church near Bergen, um, wound up on the cover of one of his albums. Um, and so, you know, they were sort of stoking the fires of this. And this was, you know, at the time of, you know, there was a lot of sort of pa moral panic around Satanism and things like this at, at the time, both in the United States and in Europe. And so they were kind of playing off of that. Um, and then eventually, um, Arseth was kind of the, um, as far as this music scene goes, he was kind of the focal point because he had a record store. Um, and ultimately what happened is that relationships between them soured to a point where um, Vikirnes ultimately stabbed Arseth to death. Um, and then went on trial, spent 20 years in prison, um, and now, uh, because 21 years is a life sentence in Norway. Um, and so now, currently, he lives in France. Um, and while he was in prison, he got very, very involved in neo-Nazi white supremacy. Um, so, it's a stand-up dude. Anyway. Uh, but so, that then became sort of the legend around this. Um, but it very quickly... Um, or I say fairly decently quickly, um, you know, after you kind of purge this criminal element from, from this, because 
you know, acts of violence and terrorism is no way to sustain a music scene. Um, so you sort of have to get these people out of it. Um, but now you find that, you know, give it about 20, 30 years, and you have a musical style that is kind of a, uh, an institution in Norway. Um, so, for example, um, here are uh, members of Mayhem and Dark Throne in the basement of R. Seth's record store. So here he is here. And they had, and this record store was named um, Helvete, which is the Norwegian word for hell. Um, and it was, uh, well, as things like this typically are, um, was uh, bankrolled by R. Seth's parents. Um, that's how it goes. Um, upper upper middle class idleness sometimes bears fruit. Um, and so you had these, these sort of pictures that um, for fans abroad, there was a real kind of, and also just knowing that there weren't very many of them, so uh, in terms of pictures. So you had these kind of like iconic pictures in front of, and particularly they had this black metal graffiti um, on uh, the wall in the basement. Or typically, you know, they would just hang out, drink beer, um, and talk trash about other bands, usually. Um, but now, after, um, you know, after, after Arseth's death, um, for a while the site was a coffee shop, and then now it is once again a record store. Um, but the... Uh, the graffiti remains, and it's kind of a tourist attraction now. Um, you go there and take take pictures in front of it, um, and you have various sites like this that people kind of travel to, um, and they've been sort of r referred to as uh, black packers. Um, and so here, you know, you can see that there that you know that now we're coming up with something that is kind of an aesthetic. Um, the violence of the past you know, gives it this sort of aura, but there's no desire to actually go back to that. Um, uh, because again, that's quite destructive. Um, things like this also then very quickly, um, again, we can see this process in which things get defused and diffused um, in this. Oh man, that is hot. KFC's new Wicked Crunch Big Box meal may be more heat than you can handle. Our crunch sandwich spiced up extra hot with hot wings, fries, salad, and a drink. Taste lives at KFC. That is real. Um, I believe it's it's from, uh, and it's not even Norwegian. This is from this is Canadian. Um, and then also ultimately, you know, you the people involved in this grow up and have other responsibilities. Um, so this is uh, Fenris, who is the drummer and songwriter behind um, Dark Throne, um, who at some point, I believe this is about, this is about 10 years ago, he was nominated um, to be on his town council. Um, one of the things about the way that works in Norway is that if you're nominated, you cannot refuse the nomination. Um, it's your civic duty. Um, and so, but you can attempt not to actually be elected. Um, so this was his anti-election poster on what this says is, please do not vote for me. Um, and paid for by cats for Fenris. Um, didn't work, he got elected and served his term. 
Um, and then ultimately, you find, uh, and also I think just the, the picture of him with his cat is a, just a good example of how you know you start to get, um, you know, a little bit at least not not quite so dangerous. Um, although I haven't met his cat, I don't know how dangerous it is. Um, likewise, uh, in terms of other other institutions, um, if you go to uh, the Museum of Popular Music in Oslo, uh, called Rockheim, uh, which just means home of rock. Uh, there is an entire room dedicated to black metal, um, which is meant to be a recreation of the um, re rehearsal room for the band Mayhem. Um, likewise, you have, uh, kind of hard to see here, but uh, just, just recently, this past, about, about a year ago, um, a new permanent collection um, opened in the uh, National Library of Norway called Enlightened Glimpses of a Norwegian Cultural History. Um, and alongside things like, um, uh, you know, manuscripts from like Henrik Ibsen and then composer Edvard Grieg and uh, things going back to the 12th century, um, there is a first edition copy of A Blaze in the Northern Sky as a part of this permanent collection. Um, and, li and likewise, there is also this um, foundation called Music Norway, uh, which provides government grants and other sorts of funding for international touring for black metal musicians, as well as any and all other kinds of Norwegian musicians. Um, it's through things like this that um, well, I believe on March 11th, um, the band Mayhem, uh, which re reformed after Arseth's death, uh, actually fairly quickly, um, is playing in Salt Lake City. Um, and I believe it's the third time they've been here. Um, the first time they came here was the only concert I've ever been to where they ran out of merchandise. Um, so they're doing okay. Uh, but again, with some help from these government institutions. Um, and so ultimately, okay, I see I'm running down on time. Uh, so just to kind of wrap it up, when Hebdige was talking about British punk, um, there's a sense that, I mean, for, for him, uh, you know, when he's looking at this, he sees sort of the moment that a music subculture hits the mainstream, that that's when he sees it starting to decline. It loses its way. Um, it becomes just another commodity. Um, and, I mean, honestly, it's sort of like, one, I, I would say that, you know, particularly once you have, you know, like middle-aged professors in sports coats talking about this at 8 a.m., in the library of a state university, that that's when you know you've lost that battle. Um, but um, it also, I think, makes a, a, an argument that in some ways that also means you won. That uh, you know this particular style in Norway uh, created a sort of alternative within, a sort of an alternative route. Within 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 heavy metal, that even though it's, of course, now sort of a part of uh, the sort of Norwegian culture industry, um, and is a part of their national brand, in the same way that like whiskey is a part of Scotland's national brand, um, that at that point you know you have that uh, that shift, and it has lasting changes. Um, and perhaps it won't stay underground forever, but um, it creates, again, this, uh, even if it can't resist sort of the forces of institutional authority, um, then ultimately it still changes the culture in the process. Yeah, so I'll wrap up there. Oh, yeah, it's right up on, on the top. Nice. Yeah.
Okay, so I'm curious if you think that um, alternatively to like black or death metal or any mm -hmm. of that, do you think that there was any like similar theme going on with like French or Italian house music? Oh yeah, like absolutely. Underground, but it kind of like loses steam over time. Yeah, that's another. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with and it had, um, yeah, house house music definitely has that kind of. Um, trajectory to it. Um, I think particularly in England, because um, there was in the, in the 1990s, um, you had actually in some ways kind of similar to punk, like the same sort of like moral panic around these like raves in the countryside and, you know, everybody doing ecstasy and, um, and that that was going to <laughs> destroy British society. Um, but yeah, it's a very, very similar kind of thing. But it starts, it starts, it starts underground, but then ultimately it, um, well, then you wind up with Daft Punk. Um, well, that's where they and that's where they started anyway, too. So, um, what sparked your interest in this specific type of music? Like what was it that made it so? Um, it's a long story, but I, but yeah, I can I can trace it. I think to, I think like anything else, it's just sort of like it finds you at a particular moment, um, and a lot of it winds up being um, kind of a coincidence. So, I would say I it found me when so I grew up in Oklahoma. Um, kind of in the middle of, you know, the suburban graveyard um, or wasteland. I don't know. Graveyard is too morbid. But, um, and I remember at one point um, encountering some of this underground heavy, heavy metal music just from, like, a friend of a friend who happened to have, like, th two CDs. Um, and I heard it, thought it was the craziest thing I'd ever heard. But there was something about it. Um, and then, you know, you read you read the liner notes like I wrote to the record label and they sent me a catalog, um, and and then ultimately with this stuff, um, the Norwegian stuff especially, there was a in 1996 there was an, an article in the uh, magazine Spin, which was kind of like Rolling Stone at the time, um, which was very sensational, um, not particularly accurate, but. Um, but there was something about it. It was, very, it, you know, had this sort of like gothic vampire kind of thing, which um, uh, appealed to me in some ways. But also had the, it did have, you know, I kind of make jokes about it. But at the time, it did have like this sort of aura of like actual danger to it. Um, but it was danger that was far away, too. So you could sort of like indulge in these fantasies over it, um, and. Um, my church youth group leader was quite concerned about it, um, and but he also he also knew that a lot of it was fantasy. But um, but so and and of course having, you know, if it makes the grown ups nervous, that helps. Um, and so that's kind of where it, and then ultimately, through a long series of circumstances, it became like a part of my job to research it, which. I'm still not quite sure how that happened, but it did. Oh, yes, I have. So, of course, all of this became, I'm actually surprised it took as long as it did for it to become a, a, a Hollywood um, production with um, Kieran Culkin. I think, Macaulay Culkin's brother, in any case, playing the guy from, from Mayhem. Um, I thought it was all right. Um, it was, I, there were, and this is sort of where you, it's also, what comes to mind to me for that was it was the example of, like, that was when all of the black metal fans were like, oh, it's like, it's, uh, it's over now. Like, now that there's a Hollywood movie. To which I was like, like where have you guys been for the last 20 years? Like, this is... Um, this is no longer really just an, just an underground thing, but it's it's decent. I mean, it's kind of sensational and sentimental, but 
um, and you know maybe kind of looks at these you know looks at it with a little bit of as much as you could say like rose colored glasses is the wrong word i'm not quite sure what word to use but it's like um because i to me the whole thing I actually wanted like the Cohen brothers to do it. I felt would have been really good because it does seem like this sort of thing where you have people trying to trying to do something and then getting like way out of their depth and then and then and it was just you know there was like a comedic element to it, um, uh, even though people did die in real life. Thank you. Thank you guys. This is great.